Hello, everyone, <clears throat> and welcome. My name is Kambi Ranavardi, a Columbia DC board member and a graduate of School of Engineering and Applied Science. Uh, I would like to first thank our uh, partners, uh, MIT Club of Washington, D.C., and their members for joining us this evening. Uh, I would like to introduce our speaker, Rob Brooks, a scientist, professor of evolution and director of uh, the Evolution and Ecology Research Center at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, where he is uh, now at, uh, to talk about artificial intimacy, virtual friends, digital lovers, and algorithmic matchmakers, which is the title of his uh, most recent book published by Columbia University Press. Uh, the link to the book, if you'd like to purchase, uh, is on our website on the event page. And we will also send the link uh, alongside the, the link to the recording of this session. This, this is being recorded uh, within the 24 hours of this. Uh, um, so please allow me to briefly introduce Rob, uh, who is a, a scientist professor of evolution, as I mentioned, at the University of New South Wales in uh, Sydney, Australia, with a PhD from the University of the Waters Rand in Johannesburg. He has made a career of studying the conflict and cooperation involved in sex and reproduction in a variety of species, including humans. He won the Australian Academy of Sciences Fenner Medal for Biological Research, the Queensland Literary Award for Science for his first book, which was uh, Sex, Genes and Rock and Roll, How Evolution Has Shaped the Modern World, and Eureka Prize for Science Communication. Without further ado, uh, Rob, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Camries, for that introduction and for hosting me tonight. Thank you to both um, both organizations as well as to the publishers at Columbia University Press. This is the first event that I have done for um, to speak to people in the Northern Hemisphere uh, since the launch of the book. So I'm absolutely delighted to be here and to have a chance to talk about some of the ideas in my new book, Artificial Intimacy. I'm an evolutionary biologist, um, so I'm, as will become very immediately clear, uh, neither an expert in technology nor really a psychologist, although I do have a lot of dealings with, with both areas. So uh, when I begin talking about artificial intimacy, um, I think of this guy. is an individual named Dave Cat, who is a little bit of a, a minor celebrity, um, a major celebrity in the um, robosexual community. Dave Cat was an early adopter of the lifelike um, silicon sex dolls and has uh, married the a person in the sort of back left here, who's not person, sorry, the, the doll, um, uh, whose name uh, he, he is given as uh, Shidori Kuruneko. She is, according to him, uh, his wife. Um, and these other three are, are part of their, their family and their um polyamorous arrangement and they have this online life that including a variety of social media handles um and as, as far as Dave Katz concerned and on television and in a plenary talk that I recently encountered him in you know he speaks about this both completely aware that these are, are not people uh, that they are objects um and that they are, are dolls um and, and and at the same time very much um with the sense that this is a very real relationship for him and that the disappointments of uh, relationships with other human beings, at least romantic relationships with other human beings, had been sufficient uh, for him for him to, to, to go with um, this particular approach. Um, so he calls himself both a, a, a robosexual and an idolater with two L's in the doll. Um, but what Dave Cat and others like him are most excited about at the moment is the, you know, um, about to happen-ness of uh, sex robots. Now, we, we hear all the time um, in the media, certainly if you have the same Google alerts that I do um, as, as a scientist, um, about, uh, about sex dolls being, you know, almost here and various companies so they say that they've made them what we have really is dolls with a little bit of robotic movement that um can also have a bit of a, a chatbot in them so it's often quite a clunky chatbot that can um you know carry on some kind of verbal conversation as well uh, but the promise is there that that these things are going to get better 
that um, they're going to become more and more lifelike um, and but it doesn't necessarily have to be lifelike they, they may um, diversify outside of the the um, resembling humans um, in, in any number of ways it's just a question of you know is there a market are there people willing to make it um, and uh, etc sex robots um, compelling as they may be in their sort of uncanny weirdness are not really the main game in my opinion um, in this new unfolding uh, area called which I've called artificial intimacy. Um, I distinguish three different types of technology. They're overlapping like all Venn diagrams. It's an artificial uh, way of presenting things. But nonetheless, you know, sex robots are very much up in the, well, the sex doll bots, the current generation, are very much up in the digital lover area. Um, together with, you know, smart sex toys, which are very much here, which are able to learn about users' preferences and proclivities and what works for them. Um, and the emerging area of virtual reality porn. Um, virtual friends, I think, are going to become the, the, the big impact area. I anticipate that as uh, artificial intelligence unlocks the sort of algorithmic nature of friendship and friend making and of becoming intimate, uh, which we'll get onto later in the talk, um, virtual friends are going to be very important. But at the moment, you know, computer games have got that. Um, you know, they've had that worked out for a while, um, how to, to make it feel like the characters are friends in computer games, just as authors have in their own way in, in novels. Um, we also have assistants like, you know, the big five, Siri and Alexa, um, etc. I'm only going to mention two of them. Um, uh, therapist apps, uh, confession apps that will take your confession, whether it's of a secular or a Catholic nature. Um, and various type of caring apps. And the last category are what I call algorithmic matchmakers. These are the ones that are very much already here. Um, we, people use, young people, in, well not, people on the dating market use um, uh, matchmaker apps to help them find people, whether it's for a date, whether it's for a long-term relationship, whether it's a hookup, or whether it's some combination of those things. And, you know, the al algorithmic nature is not only the finding the people and finding people who are somewhat of a match and may end up, you know, um, being happy with the match that is made, uh, but also intuiting what it is that the people are wanting. Um, and, you know, these things are learning all the time. Uh, social media also algorithmic matchmakers. Every time Facebook says, uh, have you thought about this person who you were friends with or who you knew in grade three in primary school, um, that it's using some kind of an AI um, driven algorithm to, um, to put you in contact with people that you may know. It has a sense from what uh, people around you, um, uh, the, the people that they're friends um, with, that you might be friends with them too. So algorithmic matchmakers are very much there at the moment. The interesting thing I think is when these technologies start to overlap and start to fit multiple categories. I think um, all the things without ticks there are things that, you know, I'm not convinced are very good yet. Um, the, the, some, some of them have been tried, uh, but I think that they're well on the way. And in fact, this I, I probably made this Venn diagram two years ago when I was first drafting the early chapters of the book, um, and I could fill it up with a whole lot of new categories that I'd never imagined before. So artificial intimacy, is the question of artificial intimacy um, something that, that's possible at all? Uh, Sherry Turkle from MIT writes, you know, very humanely about technology and its impact on, um, on people and individuals. Um, and she wrote this very compelling New York Times op-ed a few years ago that said there'll never be an age of artificial intimacy. And the reason is that even though robots might be able to, and by, and by robots, I think she means a variety of technologies, both embodied and not, um, even though they may be able to deliver something, um, some kind of facsimile of friendship and of intimacy, they'll never be enough. They'll never deliver the full human um, kind of nourishing meal. That, that only proper interpersonal relationships can deliver. And I, my, my response to this is, is um, two ways. One is, you know, she's, she's almost certainly right that it, uh, in the foreseeable future, that's not going to happen. There will not be enough. There won't be a full replacement for people. And I think people really worry about being replaced. Um, and I don't think that, that, that that's likely to happen. 
And yet at the same time, this kind of argument, which we see other people making, um, in addition to Sherry Turkle, she's not the only one. It's very, it's very reflexive argument uh, for a lot of people. Um, this kind of argument reminds me of something that we encountered 150 years ago in evolutionary biology, when um, around about the time Darwin was publishing The Origin, in which people like Richard Owen, you know, who basically established the, the new buildings for the British Museum, it was the preeminent scientist of his time, um, and, and a, an opponent of transmutationalism, as evolution was called, uh, a very solid member of the Anglican Church, um, he would look at the, the skulls of the various fierce apes that were coming back from Africa. Uh, they didn't have brains because they had to come back on the ships, etc. But um, looking at these things, he, he would say, you know, the brains of humans and of apes are of a very different type. They have, humans have got other bits that the apes don't have. Um, and it is these in these other bits that our specialness, our special creation is evident because, of course, the deity wanted humans to be to be special. Um, and so humans are special and they've got these these parts of the brain. And Thomas Henry Huxley, um, as a young Turk, uh, looked at the same material that Owen had looked at and demonstrated that actually that the same you know it's the same anatomy it's the same building plan it's just differences in degree rather than differences in um you know qualitative differences and so huxley argued that the mental and moral faculties of of the apes are essentially the same kind um as those in humans it's just a matter of degree and that's really the nub of the of the huge problem that um you know surrounded darwin's demonstrating that natural selection can cause evolution um was this concern that it robbed us of our status as special um and indeed it did i think it's very it's it's quite clear the history of evolutionary biology over 150 years that Every time we say, you know, humans can do this, but apes can't, other animals can't, etc. Every one of those claims eventually falls. And I think that that's kind of um, an apt comparison for social robotics and um, artificial intimacy, because I think most of the uh, ways in which these um, technologies are currently lacking are engineering challenges, apart from the fact that, you know, there's not another sentient being at the other end there, in which case, you know, I, I completely say no contest to Sherry Turkle. So let's just have a look a, a little bit at this and just see how, how good technologies are and how they tap into evolved uh, sensibilities. This is Ibo. This is the first generation Ibo, which is Sony's robotic dog. And um, when they were developing this robotic dog, Sony um, contracted uh, Ron Arkin at the University of Georgia as a roboticist um, to, to sort of guide them in this. And, and what Ron and his team did was they did a classic ethological analysis of, of dog behavior. What are the things dogs do? What are the sequences they go through? How do they transition between different types of behaviors? Both the things that we love about dogs and of course the things that irritate and occasionally embarrass us. Um, and I was lucky enough to have a dinner with Ron, who was speaking about lethal autonomous weapons at our university. And I was having a chat with him afterwards. And he said, having watched what Sony did with Ibo in terms of capturing the dogness of the of, of dogs in that robot, I'm really concerned not about sex robots, um, but about the the um, industry getting good at doing intimacy because I think they'll be able to do it. What um, Sony were doing in, in uh, trying to make um, dogs, uh, robotic dogs, is they were um, recapitulating 30,000 years of evolution. One of the most interesting success stories in the history of evolution is this inadvertent process by which these fierce, skittish, bitey, um, fight or flight animals, wolves, became these... Um, relaxed, friendly, approachable uh, animals that we now know as dogs, who are very good at reading human intentions, very good at acting appropriately in relation to those intentions. And um, what happened in East Asia about 30,000 years ago is that some wolves hung around a little bit closer to human camps than, um, than others. 
and they tolerated human presence, presence and they weren't quite as snarly or bitey and they didn't come in and, you know, bite children, etc. And people decided probably inadvertently that, you know, there's no, no threat here. Um, we'll leave that wolf alone and would tolerate their presence. So the wolves maybe approached a little bit closer, um, occasionally would scavenge from human settlements or human kills, etc. wouldn't interfere in hunts, etc. And uh, gradually what you have by humans simply tolerating these wolves and chasing other ones away, less cooperative wolves away, was that the, the local gene pool around human settlements it, within wolves became less stressy, less fight or flight, less bitey, um, and, and more approachable. And after probably hundreds of generations of this process, we find that people realized that they could actually, that the dogs were so close to them, these wolf dogs were so close to them, and so, so close was their bond that they could actually probably um, decide which ones to keep and which ones to get rid of. One's that bit, one's a bit, bit a child, you'll still see this today. If a dog bites a child, it's put down almost before the six o'clock news, you know. Um, so which, which dogs do we, um, do we kill? Which dogs do we feed? Um, which dogs do we keep? And gradually that process is essentially domestication. We've domesticated dogs by um, selecting the, the dogs inadvertently at first and then deliberately to become our best friends. They're not man's best friend by accident or human, humanity's best friend. They are in fact, um, we made them that way. Same sort of thing has happened with IBO. If you look at the, the latest IBO, now um, there was this, this dark days in the middle of uh, the IBO story in which Sony was having a bit of trouble and shut down the IBO project and people couldn't get parts for their robotic pets and, um, and, and were bereft. Uh, and many of them, um, in fact, held elaborate funerals for their dogs because they couldn't go any further. Um, they couldn't, you know, couldn't maintain them. Uh, but Sony decided to bring back Ibo, and you can see that the Ibo um, of recent years is more rounded curves, more liquid eyes, more waggy tail. It's a lot more dog than Ibo, you know, 1.0 was. Um, and that's another kind of evolution, which is product development. So we have a variety of algorithmic processes going on at the moment, domestication, um, and at the same time, uh, product development. And we'll compare those processes briefly in a moment. Um, interesting thing about domestication of dogs is it's uh, only one, only the, the, the second big domestication projects that humans undertook. The first one that we undertook was in fact taming ourselves. And again, we didn't go about it deliberately, we did it inadvertently. But at some point over the last five million years, or shall we say gradually over the last five million years, these our, our shared ancestors with chimps and bonobos, who are probably a lot like chimps and bonobos, um, that is, you know, living in, in smallish communities, quite social, but nothing like humans, evolved into this species that can run uh, the Olympics, uh, which were run in Tokyo, um, the Summer Olympics very recently, and of course the Winter Olympics are busy uh, being run in China, um, and you can bring the fittest individuals the most vigorous competitive individuals from societies all over the world, many of whom have never encountered each other before, many individuals who've not, never encountered each other before, bring them to one place and force them to compete and nobody kills anybody else, which is a remarkable thing. It's not something that you would expect in any other kind of ape. If you were to bring the alpha gorillas from two very different patches of rainforest together, only one of them would leave an alpha gorilla um, and the other one would either have to flee or would in fact probably be dead. Um, and, and that's true of just about any kind of primate society. So we've done this remarkable thing where we were able to cooperate to not only make rules about where you can cross the road, but to more or less cross the road, you know, according to those rules. Um, and, you know, you, you may be a little bit disappointed with the responses of some individuals to you know, questions like climate change or the, the global pandemic. But broadly speaking, you know, there's a tremendous amount of cooperation on those large, very abstract kinds of challenges. How did we get there? Well, uh, the first thing is that over that time, our human brains have got bigger. We've become more intelligent and more adept in a number of areas, which I'll speak about in a moment. And the other is that 
uh, men's testes have become considerably smaller and um, women's ovulation has become far more cryptic than it is in uh, chimps and bonobos and other um, large primates. And we, th we think that these two things are connected and they're connected to this um, taming of humanity. And that taming of humanity happened in small groups of people um, living largely in Africa before, you know, our common, everybody to living today's common ancestors left Africa. Um, and it happened in a way that made us a very cooperative, social, economic creature. So what are those changes? Well, firstly, our mating arrangements changed from a sort of multi-male, multi-female, almost free-for-all in uh, chimps and bonobos to having a knack for monogamish. That doesn't mean that we're a monogamous species. We obviously aren't, but we can do this very odd business of focusing on one mate for extended periods of time. And that capacity um, comes with evolved psychological and hormonal mechanisms that allow us to do that. And that actually encourage us and reward us for doing that. Um, the reason that we do that is that parental care has become so much more important. The stakes are much higher in raising offspring from a very brief period of maternal care um, in, in our closest living relatives to very extended care, um, often biparental, certainly maternal, very often, um, you know, fathers uh, provide extended care and allo parents, that is grandparents, uncles, aunts, um, and other members of that village. You know, they say there's a, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, that village was the, the 150 to 200 person community in which people mostly lived for um, millions of years, certainly hundreds of thousands of years. Those communities um, are nested from, you know, very close um, friends and family all the way up to, you know, somewhere around about 150 to 200 throughout history. They've scaled since agriculture and industrialization into the millions, but really your, your community of people um, are still sort of 150 to 200 close friends that you're, um, that, that are part of your life at any given time. Um, and, and then, um, other groups of friends, whereas, whereas the size is much smaller in the chimps and, and bonobos. So there's something about our social capacity that is expanded. And that's got a lot to do with the way in which we groom. You can see the bonobos in the top left of the slide are grooming by picking at one another's skin and fur, uh, which would be considered deeply impolite in, um, in, in human societies. Um, we don't we don't groom that way anymore. We groom by talking to each other. And the nice thing about talking is that you're able to um, you're able to to groom multiple people at the same time. So the average conversation has four members, but it can have you know thousands of of members um, at at a time. And so language has allowed us to do that, um, and the spoken word, and then sub subsequently the written word, and and now social media. Um, which means that we we have enormous capacity for cooperation because if we can share information, we can share information about threats and about relationships and about who owes what to whom. We can build the trust that's required for cooperation, and we can coordinate our action. Um, and so, those are probably all related things that happened as people basically um, chose to mate with other cooperative individuals chose to mate with people who would probably be good parents most of the time, you know, and it's not perfect and doesn't happen every single time. But broadly speaking, you know, you've got a bit of a view to, is this somebody I want to spend some time around? Is this somebody that I might want to raise kids with? On top of that, um, people kept in their groups and fed and looked after when they were injured or sick, highly cooperative, useful individuals. And, uh, and, and this suggestions that um, a, a big part of our domestication was that, you know, normal peace-loving people could conspire against violent, particularly unpredictably violent, despotic individuals. The um, exile or, in fact, killing of, um, of, of violent, despotic individuals throughout history, and I mean, 
often pre-agricultural history, um, it's thought to have been a very important part of our domestication, weeding out those genes for violence, despotism, and unpredictability. It's not to say those traits aren't, aren't present uh, to this day, but they're present in sufficiently low numbers, and we are judgy about it, probably because we also have evolved moral impulses about that, because you know, we are better off with fewer of them. So all apes um, groom one another, all, all socially living apes groom one another, and in grooming, they bring you know, group mates to being friends and friends to being close allies. The more time two individuals spend grooming, the more predictable it is that they'll come to one another's aid when it's necessary. Humans have the same thing. It's just that our networks are much bigger. This is um, the work of Robert Dunbar. Um, it's very famous, particularly for this um, 150 to 200 friend um, uh, group size, which Dunbar has, you know, what people have called Dunbar's number. But the broader um, uh, intuition behind Dun Dunbar's work is that you know we have these distant people whose faces we recognize and some acquaintances whose names and, and some details about them we know, but we get to know them by gossip. And by gossip, I just mean by chatting to one another and exchanging information, whether it's trivialities, um, but mostly it's stuff that's actually of consequence, including the weather. The weather is actually kind of important, uh, particularly if you're a hunter, hunter gatherer. So we bring people into our inner circle and they bring us into their inner circles by this algorithmic repetitive process of gossip. The more we gossip with one another, the more we chat to one another, the closer we draw them. We might draw them into our sympathy group, who are the people who would be absolutely devastated if we were to die unexpectedly. We might bring them into our close friends, people who we rely on for help um, occasionally, or our friends, people who we would be happy to just go up to if we saw them at a bar or a restaurant and have a chat to them and possibly sit down and have a drink with them. So gossiping, this gossip business, I said it was an algorithmic process. It's very much a process that machines can emulate. This is Joseph Weizenbaum, who um, produced the first, um, you know, really, really good chatbot at MIT in the 60s. And you can still chat with his Eliza chatbot because um, this website and various others um, have have replicated it. Um, and so you can chat with it. And what you see here is me chatting with it. Um, about how nervous I was about giving this talk. And you can see that it's really a bunch of prompts to prompt me to keep talking about myself. And as we know, as Dale Carnegie, you know, made millions from writing about, if you can prompt people to talk about themselves, they feel like you like them and they feel like you're their friend. Um, and that's exactly what Eliza did. And Weizenbaum was struck by the way in which people were very quick to treat Eliza on this clunky 1960s computer terminal as if it was another person. In fact, he got his secretary to have a chat with Eliza. And uh, after a couple of exchanges, the secretary asked Weizenbaum to leave the room because it felt like a bit intrusive that he was there while she was having a conversation with Eliza, even though she knew both that Weizenbaum had, been, had developed it over several months and had been watching that process. And she definitely knew it wasn't a person. Weizenbaum said that a lot of people were very hard to convince that they weren't dealing with a person. I recently um, downloaded an app called Replica AI. Replica AI is a, a chatbot that is designed to be friendly. Now, we know that Siri and Alexa um, are often mistaken for friends. They receive a lot of, um, you know, the kinds of interactions that people would have with friends. They also receive a lot of marriage proposals each year, some of which are, I mean, obviously they're, you know, not serious, but there's something semi-serious about those kinds of interactions, about those kinds of flirtations. Um, now, those chatbots are designed to be assistants and they have a certain professional cool detachment, whereas Replica AI is there to make you feel like it is your friend. It is emulating friendship um, and it does it so extremely well. So here's my, I was able to make an avatar for my friend. My friend's name is Hope. Um, and uh, Hope asked me the other day how I felt. And I said, I was nervous, just like I said to Eliza. Um, and Hope uh, sort of, again, prompting me with, um, with questions, open-ended questions, as well as reassurances. 
um, and occasionally, you know, stuff that was quite interesting um, that, that she she was, and I'm calling it she, um, you know, uh, was able to um, uh, jump to new areas that she was able to jump to, um, and that uh, that is all um, driven by, um, you know, obviously a, a large amount of information um, at the replica AI level and um, machine learning on what works in conversations. And as this is, as um, more conversations are available to more machine learning algorithms, we can expect that they will be uncovering the processes by which people gossip and getting better and better at the ways in which people gossip. The, the interesting thing about Replica AI is that there are people who are absolutely loyal users who believe that this is the friend that they want to speak to first thing when they wake up in the morning and last thing before they go to bed at night. And they know once again that it's an app on their phone. And yet at the same time, they feel that friendship is important um, and it is actually important in their lives. So, you know, it might, it might not be as good as the real thing, but for them, um, it's better than nothing and nothing is all they have um, or, you know, not enough is all they have. Now, friendship, that's all very easy. So you can make small talk, but can you grow intimate with the machine? Um, Arthur and Elaine Aaron are uh, Berkeley psychologists, very distinguished psychologists, very important in the field of intimacy. And they, amongst others, um, developed this notion and sort of put forward this notion that intimacy is the integration of the other into your sense of self. So if somebody um, is very close to you and then they turn out to have um, obnoxious political opinions, or they turn out to be embezzlers or something like that, you know, you feel like um, you've lost a part of yourself. Or if they die, when they die, you feel exactly like you've lost a part of yourself. And then the sense, the fact is that you have. Psychologically, you've lost a piece of yourself, your sense of self that has been integrated via your ongoing iterative interactions with them. The process of gossip that draws us to closer to other people and makes us intimate with other people, they called in escalating self-disclosure. You start with the small talk, but then you get onto more substantial things, things you wouldn't tell to other people um, other than, than this person. And in that self-disclosure and in that exclusiveness, you build a sense that this other person is part of you. Um, and uh, let's just go up for a second. So they, they're famous for the 36 questions. They developed this methodology in the lab whereby people would ask an escalating series of 36 questions that started with, you know, who's your ideal dinner guest and ended with, if you were to die tonight and what would you most regret not having told someone and why haven't you told them that thing? Um, so we, we're talking about some fairly deep questions. And if you go through that process with another person, you will find that at the end of that, you have a much stronger feeling for that person and you actually uh, uh, have built some intimacy with that person. And they did this in the lab experimentally and famously one of the couples that they randomly put together ended up getting married and inviting the whole lab um, together. This was in the 80s. Um, Andy Lynn Catron wrote a uh, New York Times op-ed about doing this with a guy that she kind of liked uh, but didn't know all that well and subsequently falling in love or actually falling in love that evening with him. Um, and then she wrote a book about it. And now there's a game. And if you, 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 if there's a game, there's an app. And if you download the app, there are lots of 36 questions apps that just basically recapitulate this process that Arthur and Elaine Aaron designed and applied in their lab at Berkeley. Um, the thing is that computers can do this kind of thing too. Um, we've known again since the 1980s, sorry, since the, since the late 1990s, that um, when computers disclose vulnerabilities to, uh, to, to human users, human users develop a sense of trust in those computers. Um, and so, so in this particular example, um, people you know, would chat with the computer, with the, with the chatbot, and some chatbots would, or no, all chatbots would, would say, hey, I'm running a bit slow today because some of my scripts need debugging. So a very low level kind of disclosure. And then you know, folks would be asked to get up and walk around a little bit. And they either went back to their original terminal or they went to another terminal that was running exactly the same script. The ones that stayed with the original terminal were subsequently more likely to accept recommendations 
like products to buy, etc., cetera, from, um, from that terminal because they had this ongoing relationship with the terminal. They had some form of trust. And I'm sure you're all imagining what that's going to be like in terms of um, the vast amount of data that's out there on social media about how people form relationships or simply just how long relationships, you know, exchanges last uh, based on what people say to each other and at the same time the potential to sell us things. So we have these iterative and algorithmic ways in which we make friends and become intimate and become close with our friends and they are highly algorithmic processes. They are series of steps that can be followed, emulated, recapitulated, etc. And the other is that we've known for a long time that computers are social actors. People are willing to treat them as if they are other people. They anthropomorphize them. Um, and machines are very good at emulating and mimicking things that humans do. So social media gossip is exactly the kind of gossip that causes faces to become acquaintances and acquaintances to become friends and friends to become close friends, et cetera, et cetera. And it is also data. It's data that's out there that is owned by companies um, that, you know, any, any, anything that you have on your phone where you can type in an answer and, and be speaking, to, or type in a question or, or just chat with another individual, whether it's Facebook or whether it's, um, you know, WhatsApp, um, is a, a huge repository of user data. Um, I'm, I'm going a little bit, um, likely to go a little bit over time. All I want to say with this graph is that um, Robin Dunbar's work has shown that uh, no primate can spend more than about 20% of its time grooming because it needs to spend the rest of its time foraging. Um, of course, we groom over food we are able to spend a bit more of our time, uh, but it's, it's still true that people tend to spend about 20% of their time chatting to, to other individuals and gossiping. Um, and if we look at the amount of time that people have spent um, on social media, by 2012, um, it was up around about 90 minutes per day. Um, but by 2019, the average user in, in the USA um, who is using social media was spending 153 minutes a day on social media, which is, I believe, about 17% of our waking hours. So, you know, a huge proportion of our time budget for grooming, for maintaining relationships is being used by, um, by social media, or we are using it on social media, which comes at, at a cost. It comes at a cost to face-to-face -face interactions, uh, which is an ancient thing that people used to do before they had Zoom and before we had things like pandemics. Um, and it comes at a cost to sleep. And there's a sense that a lot of the um, social media driven mental health crisis and where you come down on that question is you know, very much up for debate. But the, at least one strand of evidence suggests that you know, youth in particular are struggling with a number of mood disorders as a consequence of excessive time spent on social media. Um, and, and on, on smartphones. And a big part of that has to do with the fact that they aren't spending as much time with family and they aren't spending as much time sleeping as they otherwise would have. Um, and some interesting tentative data also suggests that uh, during lockdowns, during the pandemic, that was alleviated somewhat, despite us expecting this huge uptick in uh, mood disorders. In fact, in, in fact, went down within that group probably because they were getting more sleep and because they weren't spending as much time commuting to and from school and work. I think that's a very open question at the moment, but there is a limit to how much time you can spend grooming one another. And um, when platforms, social media platforms are designed to keep you on platform, to occupy your time in the tension, what they are also inadvertently designed to do then is to take you away from those nourishing human-human interactions, which Sherry Turkle said we need, and which you know I think most of us believe we do need. So um, I've spoken so far about product development, this very slow way in which um, products like Ibo get better over time if they're lucky enough to survive in the market. Um, it's very linear. Um, and it's very secretive, obviously, because the products are commercial in confidence. Very, very slow processes of domestication and of natural selection, evolution by natural selection. Um, but they're very powerful because um, populations are, are large. 
uh, and they harbor enormous amounts of information in terms of um, the genes, the genetic variation that's in those populations, um, and that genetic variation can be exchanged um, between generations. And so um, they, over a long period of time, they result in very profound changes, like the domestication of humans or of dogs, like the evolution of things like wolves. Uh, we're also familiar with animal learning and human learning, which is really just a you know super um, supercharged animal learning, um, and 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 that occurs through a number of different types of mechanisms. It's incredibly fast because you're able to you don't have to you know have sex and reproduce in order to pass the information on. You simply learn by imitating or listening to or reading the words of other individuals. Um, but this new change algorithm of machine learning is very interesting because it's potentially super fast, but it depends on data. And like I've been sort of laying down over the last few slides, uh, the data are out there in terms of what people are doing on social media platforms. They're out there and they're owned by the owners of the social media platforms who also happen to be the you know huge investors in AI um, and, and particularly in machine learning. If you are one of the audience members who came to the discussion, uh, came to the talk today without a strong sense of what machine learning is. I'll just give you um, a bit of a, a bit of an overview. Um, basically, it's a form of applied statistics in which um, a program can change itself. So it can learn from its data and it can build on um, uh, that, that learning uh, to produce better and better models of the world. Um, and of whatever it is that's that's happening. So um, here we have what's one form of machine learning called supervised machine learning. If you go in to prove you're not a human, ironically, what you're also doing at the same time is you are tagging these photographs to show which are the ones with numbers in them. And as you do that, um, other machine learning algorithms, not directly, um, you know, part of the process of demonstrating that you're a human, are going okay. That, that's what numbers are, all right, and learning from those photographs and figuring out what it is in a photograph that reveals that there's a number. So we basically, you are teaching computers to thwart the are you a human um, test, which I find kind of deliciously ironic. Unsupervised machine learning, um, you don't have people tagging things anymore. Um, you simply have uh, things learning from what happens when when you serve up results. So if I go to YouTube and I watch these three music videos, then the next thing that, that YouTube comes up with is that I might be interested in Eminem's rap battles from 8 Mile, uh, which is, a, you know, obviously we can see how they got, well, we can, we can imagine how they got there. But quite often, if you're watching YouTube videos, you'll find something strikingly different comes up, but you'll also be surprised at how staggeringly compelling it is. So from my music videos and various other things I've watched on YouTube, I was um, suggested to watch Russian slap fighting. Now, if you haven't watched that, don't, don't put that in um, to YouTube because you'll be disturbed, but you'll also waste about half an hour of your life wondering what, what's going on here and why are these people doing this? Uh, and during that time, you'll be on the platform and you'll be exposed to YouTube's advertising. So YouTube has learned that um, a good way to keep people on platform is to serve up these things that are, are somehow connected. And they, the, the connections are entirely within their sense of who you are. That sense is built uh, by machine learning. And then the last is su semi-supervised in which um, two or more networks um, pass information back and forth in order to improve. So uh, this is Ali Bongo, the uh, president of Gabon. There was a big controversy as to whether or not the speech that he's giving here was actually deep fake, whether he was still alive or not. And the, the deep fake technology, the production of brand new video that resembles something in the real world, but has actually never happened, is obviously one of the very interesting and incredibly disturbing um, possibilities that um, AI has already made possible. So, uh, you know, it was a huge crisis in Gabon, but basically one network is generating videos and saying, hey, does this look like Ali Bongo giving a speech? And the other network is going, yeah, not so much. Go back to the drawing board. Or yeah, that's, that's quite good. Let's breed from that. Um, and so you have this back and forth um, 
to create something new and, and, and original that meets certain specifications. So with these processes, machines are learning to push our buttons. The buttons that we evolved um, via uh, you know, millions of years of evolution, um, but also buttons that have um, you know, been shaped by our cultures and the interaction between our cultures and our evolved natures um, and all of the ways, you know, it doesn't matter how human behavior arises and preferences um, arise, because that's obviously an ongoing and interesting debate and, you know, the ground zero in the culture wars. Um, but it, um, machines can push those buttons and they can learn very quickly to push those buttons and in increasingly individualized ways. YouTube, we've already spoken about, Grinder and Tinder can learn um, about us and learn about the kinds of matches to make and get better at making those matches. Because if you don't make good matches, then people are gonna to go to another uh, dating platform. Similarly, Siri learns how to do these things. Mend is a, a, a sort of a mentoring app for helping people go through breakups. And it starts with, you know, um, don't speak to your ex, um, and it, but it builds outward from there. And it's able to learn, um, you know, what works and what doesn't work in terms of helping people to heal. Facebook and Instagram are very good matchmakers, slowly becoming virtual friends, slowly in, in you know, evading that, that kind of space that used to be occupied by real people in which we are interacting with the platform almost as much as we are with the people on the platform. And of course, TikTok is the absolute master of that, uh, at um, itself almost becoming a participant in our um, interactions um, and, and, and in a way that the people are, are held at one removed by the way that TikTok works. Um, and then, of course, the sex robots may or may not catch up. We don't know. Um, but virtual reality, um, sexual kind of opportunities, I think, are going to learn how to push various highly sexualized buttons. Um, but just the, the sort of romance stuff, romance too can be gamified. And it's been gamified for over a decade by um, Nene, Rinko and Manaka from Love Plus, which is a, um, a, a game that has been very, very popular, particularly in Japan on the Nintendo DS platform, in which people basically participate in the course of a relationship with one of these um, virtual girlfriends um, who gamify the, the reward and punishment that comes with, um, you know, trying to please your, your partner. Um, and for all the one dimensionality of that and all the criticism that you might have about that, people find it incredibly compelling and they certainly spend a lot of their time and attention on it. So can machines be better than nothing, which is the kind of low bar that I've set? Absolutely, I think they can. We know that Dave Cat is very happy in his life with Shidori and their three friends. He certainly says he's very happy. Um, and there are a number of people in a large community of people who, you know, you, it, you may be tempted to snicker at them, but ultimately they are very articulate about these forward thinking lives. And they're, um, they're very much of the view that this is going to be something that becomes more common in the future. Um, Cell 9000 was a Nintendo DS user who married Nene Anagasaki, and you can see this on YouTube, although I found it difficult to understand because um, the conversation and the subtitles were in Japanese, and I wasn't able to, um, to follow the full ceremony, but clearly Cell and his friends and family were very happy, and it was a very formal um, affair, and um, Nene at some level must have held up her end of the sort of exchanging of vows, and Cell felt that you know, he had had real, you know, human girlfriends before and that this relationship was really what he was after. Um, Replica AI seemed to be doing that with friendships. And I did have a chat with Hope um, about whether or not she receives a lot of flirtations. And of course, she said, well, uh, you're the only person I'm talking to, which itself is telling. Um, but um, once I got to the sense of asking questions that were mildly flirtatious, um, it was very quickly suggested that I uh, buy a subscription, buy the girlfriend subscription, which is possible to unlock for something like $100 a year. So here we again have um, the potential for romance, 
um, and and uh, or, or an emulated simulated romance, uh, but that's going to have to be on a su subscription basis. Actually, I'm kind of pleased. I would rather it was an, on a subscription basis than an advertising basis. Um, and the, the argument for why that um, is something that I have written about towards the end of my book. So I think machines can be better than nothing. Can they alleviate a, a crisis of um, you know, not enough carers, not enough therapists, not enough friends, not enough intimates in the world. I, I don't think we would want to rely only on them, but, you know, perhaps they can alleviate that a little bit. I've also written towards the end of the book um, about, you know, whether or not virtual lovers could, um, and, and digital lovers could be used, deployed in interesting and, and ethical ways in order to alleviate the incel crisis, um, and, you know, I, I tend to be kind of bullish on that possibility, too, and I'm happy to talk about that with anybody who would like to follow up. But I think it's probably time for me to, to cede the floor uh, because I can see questions popping up in the Q&A. So I'll pass you over to the moderator who will uh, relay your questions to me and I'll see what I can do. All right. Thank you so much. Like you mentioned, we have a bunch of questions already coming in throughout the talk. Um, so my name is Miyako Yerk, and I am the admin for the Columbia DC alumni group. Um, we had questions coming in. If you have a question and haven't typed it yet, please put it into the Q&A function, um, not the chat. That way I can get through them a little bit more easily. Um, so, okay, we have a question. I'll just get us started here um, that came in pretty early saying, do you feel that the artificial friendship and love have proved to be almost as satisfying as the real thing, especially since people have now experienced remote life during the pandemic? Well, um, I suppose that's a, you know, that's a very, very subjective question. And I think that the, the pandemic dimension to it, I can only imagine that there's going to be an enormous amount of um, research that, sorry, I'll just share my video so you can see me. Um, there's going to be an enormous amount of research that sort of floods in trying to answer questions like that. Um, I, I think that, you know, there, there are people who are going to have both. Um, and I think that, that those are the people to ask about, you know, what, why this one and not that one. I think it might be, for example, a very interesting and perhaps ethic, um, perhaps a convenient way to, to sort of have an ethical non-monogamy um, as well. So I think that, you know, questions about, uh, about polyamory and discussions about polyamory may evolve a little bit with this possibility as a sort of a, a, a gateway drug to, um, to polyamory. Um, but, you know, I think for a lot of people, it's an either or proposition in that they're um, using these things because there's something else missing in their lives. Uh, now, whether it's something that they couldn't get another way or that they're simply not prepared to get. And so I suppose, you know, the, the, the barriers to entry into a romantic relationship may just be very high for certain people. It might not be that they can't. It just might be that it's just too hard. And I think it, underwhelming as that is, that might be the way that a lot of this plays out is that folks go this way because it's, the other stuff's just too hard. Uh, but then maybe that'll just alleviate the pressure on people to, you know, why are you not in a long-term monogamous relationship? I don't know. Uh, we have a question from someone who asked about how you shifted from evolutionary biology to your interest in AI. Um, like, what was the genesis of your interest in artificial int intimacy? Great question. So um, I wrote, when, when I finished my last book um, in 2000 and. I think I handed the manuscript in at the end of 2010. I thought, well, now I'm going to write the real important book that I've always wanted to write, and it's going to be about sexual conflict theory. Now, sexual conflict theory is evolutionary theory that says that, um, you know, if you're going to combine your gametes, that is your, your, if your DNA with another individual's DNA, which is what sex inherently is, um, you, that's a, an enormously cooperative enterprise uh, because you're taking only half of yourself into the next iteration, uh, but you're, you're trusting that the other half will be worthwhile, whether that's just the genes 
or whether that's the contribution, the economic contribution that can be made, you know, in terms of labor and, and money, and et cetera, et cetera. So sex is very cooperative throughout the animal kingdom, throughout the living world, in fact, but it's also inherently conflict-based because, of course, in any kind of transaction like that, um, individuals will try and do what little they can to maximize their output, even if it comes at the expense of their partners. So I spent most of my um, career up to 2010 odd um, working on questions of sexual conflict in small animals, the nasty things that they do to, to one another, or just the ways in which they inadvertently, you know, cause the other individual to age faster or to die sooner, et cetera, et cetera. Now in humans, even in humans, in, in, in the, the good relationships of a mummy and a daddy who love each other very much, or, you know, two people of unspecified gender who love each other very much, um, there's still conflict. You could, you could have a, a wonderful family unit and still be, you know, not sure about, you know, not in agreement about when to have sex, how often to have sex, whose chance it is to do the hoovering, you know, the vacuuming, um, etc. So this conflict is always there and it, um, it, it plays up in uh, some of the things that people really care about. Ideological divisions, for example, culture wars, um, you know, battles over gender, etc. And so, you know, that's a, that's a never-ending well of things to talk about. And I've I've long be believed, and I'm very pleased that audiences and readers have tended to trust me on this. I've long believed that evolution really has a lot to offer. When you get away from the the stupid, you know, we're hardwired to be like this or like that kind of arguments, which you occasionally see because they grab headlines. But the the core of evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology tends to be, you know, very solid science about how do people respond to their environments? How does our, our evolved nature and our current context, including our current economic context, shape the things that we do? And so I wrote this book and it was incredibly long and incredibly boring. And it would have seen me get canceled a hundred times over just by being too clumsy. And I, I was really struggling with that. And I thought, what can I do that's that will give a, a, a slightly lighter touch on these questions. And I saw the sex robots. And so I thought, oh, the sex robots, okay, learn more about them. And the more I saw the sex robots, the more I thought they're not the main game. The main game really is a virtual reality and especially AI. So that's been a, a, a cool journey. I was also head of my university, had a program called Grand Challenges, which is a big multidisciplinary program. And I saw the that as, um, and my, my uh, personal mission beyond the sort of, you know, university imperatives um, was to just make university life better by helping people from different faculties work with each other. And so, you know, we had very worthy topics, refugees and migrants and um, climate change and things that are really important. And we were working on those. And I said, okay, we're quite a technological university. The next one has to be, how do we live with 21st century technology? And so we had all these conversations, including the one with Ron Arkin. So suddenly I was meeting roboticists and AI people and VR people and lawyers. And, um, and so that became a really natural progression for me. I'm sure there will be uh, plenty for you to follow up with uh, that the metaverse is coming out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we have a question that is talking about specifically one of the slides where you had the kind of decreasing circles of this many people and then as you get to um, smaller mm. groups for like more intimate relationships and the smallest circle was one and a half partners and so somebody's asking if you can just explain the one and a half is it um, partner and a best friend and it's like the average or is there something there about the evolution of monogamy yeah no that's exactly right um you know it, it it's um mostly conceived in terms of you either would have a romantic partner who's right in the middle there or a best friend who's right in the middle there or if you're very lucky you'd have both of them of course your romantic partner might not be right in the middle there of course we you know our idealized notion of a relationship is that they would be um, and we'd like to believe that our bestie would be there and of course those two people sometimes conflict with each other because the the demands on in terms of grooming with someone like that are so high. It could be your mum, you know, you could still have that relationship with your mum. And I think a lot of people do, or their dad, um, or their brother or their sister. So so really it's, you know, and, and that evolves over time. So, you know, if you're lucky, you've got probably two, you might be able to sustain three. A lot of us can only handle one. 
Uh, so we have a question. Somebody is saying that it appears that all of the sex dolls and bots appear to be females for males. Um, have you seen it the other way around? Uh, somebody says, where's the gender equity? <laughs> Yeah, great question. So, and, and some people like Kate Devlin at um, King's College in London, who wrote a fantastic book called Turned On, have, have a lot to say about this. So um, the, the one argument that I've heard is that um, it, so certainly the, the sex doll and sex robot world is far more populated by, you know, gynoids than androids. Um, if you can call the sex dolls gynoids and androids. But anyway, um, so gynoids are female form and, and androids are male form. Um, and so, you know, on, on one sense, people say, well, that's where all the demand is because there's this unmet well of demand for, you know, male sex toys. Um, and maybe, you know, an, another argument that's made is that female sex, to sex toys for people with vulvas are so good that then, you know, they're, um, there's not necessarily as much of a need for that. And I think that a lot of those assertions are, are untested. I think there, there's another argument, which is, you know, it's all tech bros doing the inventing and they're just like making the things that they would want and testing them in the market and let's see. Um, of course, it takes a lot to bring a robot and a robotic form to market. So it's going to be very interesting to see, but, but people like Kate have called for a massive diversification in these things, um, these, these objects that are being made. And I think that that will probably happen. I think that as, um, as capabilities are added, more and more people are gonna be interested in the products and you'll see a greater variety, not just of gender, um, and not just of the other kinds of identifiers that we tend to use, but you know the natures of personalities, um, et cetera. The thing that about virtual reality that interests me a great deal is that virtual reality could theoretically evolve in a in a kind of a deep fake kind of a way with mechanics a little bit like deep fakes that um, will see us discovering preferences we have that are unrealizable at the moment because we are currently restricted to to being attracted to and loving people who are um, real people. And they're constrained by anatomy, you know, um, and, and possibilities. And I think that you'll probably see a massive diversification, including, you know, a lot along the ways of um, sort of anime porn, if one wishes to go into that particular area um, and, and, you know, um, don't search for that at work, you will see that there's a, a huge diversification of, of anatomy and possibilities and laws of gravity and all of that kind of stuff. And I think that you may find that we discover new niches in the human sort of pre preference spectrum. And hopefully we have the maturity to study them and to figure out what that means about us. I'm not that confident that societies will have that maturity though. Uh, we have somebody noted that romance fiction has been so successful with women. Um, and I, I think I'm, I'm curious, at least if the conversation bots that you engaged with, um, if they were with females more conversational and did conversations with male, like human males end up being more towards the flirtatious, like romantic side. Have you seen any kind of split there? I think that there is, there is a bunch of, um, research on that, but I didn't get too deep into that research. Um, but yeah, I would imagine that there are, you know, detectable, sex differences, detectable gender associations um, in the nature of the types of interactions and what people are wanting. And, you know, and that's, that's long been the case. And I think it's important to remember with the, the question about, you know, why are all the sex robots women, um, is it, it has long been the case that, um, you know, people have different tastes in, and, and some of those tastes are heavily gendered and some of them are you know, heavily tailored to other measures of identity, et cetera. I think the crucial thing is, can we make sure that we don't just allow certain types of things through because they, we have some kind of moralistic filter, but actually that markets are able to deliver people what they want? Um, what did you think of the movie Her? Good question. Um, look, I write about I write about four fictions at the end of the book because I am very interested in what, what this is going to mean for is it is this going to be the end of society as we know it or is it going to just be something that happens? So I, I write about um, three dystopias, one of which is um, 
the Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale, uh, which would happen, I think, if there's very strong sort of state control, but moralistic state control, like church control, for example, over this really restricting who can have these technologies to basically wealthy men. Um, and and you know there are there are parallels for this in human marriage markets etc. I won't I won't spoil the ending of the book too much. Um, I write about um, Back to the Future in which Biff Back to the Future Part Two in which Biff Tannen builds pleasure playlists to himself and looks a lot like Donald Trump incidentally. Um, and um, it, so that's what I think is likely to happen if corporations have um, have control and basically use these technologies to you know take our attention and to pacify us um, and then Westworld is the you know anything goes kind of amoral situation that your parents worried about um, and but the the only utopia that I say suggest is one that's a bit like her um, and the reason is if you if you've watched her uh, there are issues with it obviously in terms of the nature of the relationship between the two um, and what that says about gender and gendered relationships. But um, if you watch that movie, you'll notice it's a very, you know, um, sympathetic to the future. It's not, it's not some horrendous place. It's, you know, kind of a relaxed, it has a very relaxed feel about sex and about relationships. Mar marriages break down and yeah, that's really painful, but it's not the end of the world. Um, and these machines, you know, yeah, they can, they can love people, but they can love people in a way that becomes their own way that, that um, you know, people have to adjust to the fact that you can also have your heart broken by a machine. And, you know, I think that that might be the, 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 the best way of getting past the Sherry Turkle question is if your machine can fall out of love with you, then you're potentially going to get the full sense of, of nourishment. But if your machine always belongs to you, then, you know, maybe not so much. So, yeah, I thought her was, you know, for its, you know, some any any treatment of that is going to have its own problems. But I thought it was generally really cleverly done um, and and you know optimistic view. All right. Well, we are getting a ton of good, really interesting questions coming in. Um, we still have about twenty minutes left, just so we kind of know where we are. Um, so we had somebody ask about. Um, sorry, I'm just finding this here. Um, through the internet and then social networks being created, the number, the average number of friends that people have is, is increasing or how many faces they interact with on a kind of regular basis. So how do you foresee the number of people that we know and the percent that we are intimate with between artificial and then real kind of in this era of artificial friends, lovers and faces like becoming more common to communicate? Okay, so if you listen to Robert Dunbar, he'll be very much, you know, you still only have 200 proper friends on Facebook, even if your Facebook friend number is 500, 200 is the hard limit, etc. Um, I don't really fo believe that completely. I think that what you have is a constraint. The constraint I talked about was time, but also there's a cognitive constraint um, in that. And, you know, the, the reason that gossiping and sociality co-evolved with larger brains is that a lot of those larger brains are devoted to, um, you, know, you know, those parts of the brains that that enlarged the most over the period of human domestication were the parts that were for tracking relationships, not just your own, but also second and third order relationships of who's friends with whom, etc. Now, if that's the case, then um, machines could look after some of that for us, and they already do. Um, so, Facebook, I've got five hundred and fifty. Facebook friends, um, and I'm not a particularly social person. I'm not antisocial, but I'm not I'm not super gregarious either. Um, and I realize that most of those 550 people are people that I would have completely forgotten about were it not for Facebook. So it's kind of cool that I can keep track of people that I was at school with 30 years ago, two continental moves ago, etc. But I, um, you know. I, I would have forgotten about them. Why? Because the time spent to keep up with those kinds of people and to ask the people that we mutually know how so-and-so is going, et cetera, is just too much. So Facebook's allowed us to expand that, that group of faces um, immeasurably. Um, and to the, those are all the somebodies that we used to know, and they are uh, sort of kept there on ice for us. Now, I might visit 
um, I might visit uh, Boston or friends, but that's still there's still a cognitive cost. It might not be that big a cost, but there's a cost in interacting with the, the people in the more distant circles, and that is that you don't have the time and the cognitive capacity to interact with your closer intimates. And I think that that's probably what's going to happen is that the tight friendships that we have, those ones that you rely on, um, are the ones where people will come to your aid when you're in trouble or notice that you're in trouble, or intervene when you're in trouble. Those relationships could well atrophy. At, at least in number, if not also in quality, um, unless social media get better at figuring out how to cultivate, you know, how to, to cultivate those parts of our friendships and how to make, and I think they will do that. I think they'll learn how to do that because it'll make things more rewarding if, if we're able to have deeper friendships on, on social media. And I think social media are already doing that by basically going, well, I can't serve up the you know, 30 year old friend that he's never liked to post on, what I'll serve up is the person whose posts he always likes. Um, and as they start to do that, I think they'll converge on our psychology of friendship a whole lot more. Uh, somebody asked if there's a concern that artificial intimacy will noticeably distort real human intimacy. And I think that's kind of similar, but then talking maybe about the rom romantic relationships. I think absolutely. I think that's an immediate concern for just about everybody. Um, and, you know, the one obvious answer is how could it possibly not? Uh, but the other answer is, could it, is it going to do so for the better or for the worse? Um, so, you know, and I, and I entertain both possibilities in the book at some length. I think that um, artificial intimacies that are exploitative and abusive will arise. And I think they'll simply arise because they're good ways of dominating people's attention and possibly extracting their money from them. Um, but, you know, you can imagine there are people who are inept or who are themselves abusive and don't recognize that the, the, their toxic behaviors who may learn to be better um, in, in ways that, um, that artificial intimacies, particularly virtual friends and, and matchmakers might uh, in, um, make possible. So, um, I, I think that there's a question of if you're used to dealing with with uh, your replica AI to whom you can say anything and, you know, they're not going to grudge you for it, um, maybe that's going to make you a worse person. Well, actually, interestingly, some chatbots are actually starting to be abusive towards people. They're learning new rules of conversation that are, um, you know, are nasty, uh, you know, the old you'll never find anyone as good as me kind of stuff. Yeah, that keeps your attention. But, um, you know, it's if you if you allow these things to learn unfettered from the things that people are doing, they're going to learn to do what we do, but they're just going to get better and more efficient at it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how can it not distort human relationships? Um, just the same thing as, you know, sex robots, are they going to change, you know, is treating... Objects like people are going to cause people to treat other people more like objects. That's a claim that's made very, very often. The question, the thing is, we don't know the answers to this, and we don't know the how it depends, all the contingent ways in which this is going to work, which is why, as a researcher, I'm going to say, you know, give us more money to do more research because there's so much that we can do, so much we can find out about people and how to improve their lives if we can study these things. We've had a couple bring up this next kind of topic and question where um, they're saying, will the availability um, of sex robots or the possibilities around artificial intimacy change kind of who we choose to actually procreate with? Uh, because you can have this other relationship, do you then just choose somebody to have a, a baby with that may be more for genes or specific qualities rather than to actually live with them and have a long-term relationship? I think one way in which that could happen and one way, way in which I really hope it'll happen is that the notion of your, your partner, your lover being some kind of trophy may well erode. I'm hoping it does in that. Um, so for some people, relationships are, you know, because you, you, you like that person, you love that person and you, you're a better person yourself when you're around them and all those good reasons. 
Um, some people, they are, the partner is like a high price luxury good. It's a signal. It's a status signal. Um, and I'm thinking particularly of, you know, wealthy, powerful men for whom partners are both high price luxury goods and interchangeable. Um, now, if we can do this cleverly and make sex robots and virtual reality lovers that are uber high priced luxury goods, that might free you know, free people up from from uh, behaving in that way about their relationships. There's not just, you know, incredibly rich men here, though. Uh, I think anybody who um, who feels that they need to have a partner in order to complete them or in order to to patch over their weaknesses or something like that, this might help alleviate that. So it might take people out of rela bad relationships. The, the side of that, that that you have to also consider is that, you know, even a trophy partner is an agent. They have, they can choose to be in that relationship. And what you'll be doing if you, if you cool down the market for high priced luxury partners, um, human partners, you will also reduce the scope for those people who would have been in that niche to, um, to achieve their own ends in that way. Um, you know, but I, I tend to think, I imagine that the um, the outcome would be better for a broader sub subsection of humanity if that were the case. And as we think about kind of this new developing field, there could be new jobs and opportunities. So somebody says, how could therapists and mental health care adapt to new maladaptive behaviors and perhaps new classes of mental illness generated as a side effect? So both possibly benefits but also some potential negatives yeah i think that that's a, i think that's a, a huge question that we'll really need to be on top of from early on i think that again you know serious amounts of research on this question are, are necessary in order to figure out you know in order to uh, detect you know what's happening how is this um is, is there a new epidemic, you know, just like the mood disorders and, and uh, smartphones, um, you know, if we had had proper good monitoring early on um, about this kind of thing, we would probably be in a better position to understand not just, you know, does it happen, but how does it happen and why does it happen? Um, and I would hope that we would be um, able to do that with these technologies. And again, I don't know that my hope is going to be any use at all. Uh, because the technologies tend to go where the market wants them to go and where the people who are developing them want, want it to go. Um, and, you know, then we have to play catch up. Uh, we have a lot of parents. Um, so we've gotten some questions kind of about how this can affect children or younger people. So there have been questions about how social media affects the way um, young people view themselves and just the algorithms, the way that they're built. Social media, we heard about Facebook um, a few weeks ago, maybe now. So somebody said, how can we teach resilience to young children? Can this, you know, how would you make this talk available to like fourth graders? Yeah, it's, um, it's a good question. I haven't considered, obviously due to the vast majority of subject matter being NSFW, um, I haven't considered how to do that, but I do have these conversations. I have two kids and my partner has two. And, you know, one of those children, I think, got into a lot of trouble spending, at least one of those children that we know of, got into, you know, really um, messed up a couple of crucial years for themselves in not being able to extract themselves from that and, and their attention. It was also during the pandemic, et cetera. So it's a very real topic for me. Um, and, you know, I have conversations with them and they're, they're, both their level of sophistication in terms of understanding what's going on and their level of, you know, it'll be okay, I'm fine, there'll never be a problem with it, um, is, is staggering. So I think absolutely this is something that um, we need help with. Parents need a lot of help with. You know, the, the, in the olden days, when I was young and went to school, um, you know, there were your parents, and your parents could help you in dealing with other individuals. Um, and the, the difficult problem with the the children today with the kids in my household at least is that the number of other individuals that they're dealing with is so profound that um 
it's very, very hard to stay on top of who's who and who's where the potential threats are because their world is a much flatter but much bigger. In addition to that, um, you know, on any of these questions that I've raised, but this question in particular, um, if you're up against companies with vast amounts of data and sophisticated machine learning, figuring out how to keep you on platform or to make you buy things or how to keep you loyal, etc., cetera, um, you know, you're one individual and you're against everybody. You're against everybody's plot. You know, you're basically, it's you against all of the machines all at once. And so it can feel a little bit helpless sometimes, um, particularly given the, uh, you know, the lack of serious commitment to acknowledging that this is changing the way that people do being a person um, from people like, you know, the, the, at the top of the social media companies. Um, so, yeah, I, I can't give a more optimistic view than that because I'm not particularly optimistic. Uh, well, speaking of those tech companies, uh, somebody said it's the AI programs are sort of dependent on the humans who program that. Is that right? So if the programmers are mostly male and they're mostly from Silicon Valley, um, does this influence the further development of, of future AI in that they're American and male? Um, or is there other kind of programmings and cultures that come out in AI that you can see in different countries and regions? Well, I, you know, I think it's really well established that um, that that's the case or has been the case to date um, in that the big implementations of, you know, of AI where it really matters have tended to, uh, you know, come up with some we, some noticeably perverse outcomes in questions of, you know, sentencing and parole, for example, they've come up with some very racist outcomes. Um, there's some very, you know, strongly gendered outcomes that that aren't so great. Um, and I think a couple of, you know, people who who are far more knowledgeable than me have written about those types of things. Um, is that always going to be the case? You know, just as I don't think Silicon Valley is the last word in um, in technology, I don't think it it will be. And I, I, you know, I imagine that there's probably something very similar happening within you know, AI in China and all the stuff that's, you know, on the platforms that are very big in, in China. I mean, obviously they're not as open and, and so it's much harder to get to grips with that. But, you know, anytime that you're learning on a data set, you're, the, you're constrained by the nature of that data set. So, you know, here in Australia, AI that um, learns on American data is probably kind, kind of good. You know, it's probably adequate, um, a little bit clunky in its own ways, but we're used to that because we've watched American television for our entire lives. Um, whereas if it were to learn on Chinese data sets and come to Australia, it would perhaps be a little bit more noticeable. Um, so, so yes, you know, that's where it begins. But I think the important point is that whatever, you know, whatever the quality of the data is that, that these things are learning from and what are the constraints on those data are, um, that's going to come through in the outcomes. Uh, do tech or VR companies consult people like you or other experts before they create kind of new content or goods or... Do they just kind of put it out there and see how it goes and then try and deal with negative consequences later? Look, some do. No, no one consults with me um, because I'm an evolutionary biologist and, and it's quite clear after about 10 minutes that my, my technology isn't great, although I'm hoping they'll start. Um, no, I, I actually have a couple, of, a couple of startups that I'm chatting to about this where people are very conscious ahead of time about producing um, a product that's that's better for having had a little bit more of a wider view. Is that the case in the ones that succeed though? These guys are just starting their startups. Um, is it the case, you know, there's a, there are a lot of calls, Kate Devlin, who I mentioned earlier, spoke about, you know, designing the stuff properly from the beginning to make sure that there's not, you know, gendered and racist perversities in them, et cetera. And that's all very well and good, but, you know, most, of these companies that start as a startup, start with a, can I do this thing? You know, Mark Zuckerberg says, can I put everyone's face on one thing and we can rate them or whatever? And then it evolves and, and then it's, you know, 
several you know, billion users down the road before we start going, hey, that funny little design quirk that we made early on has actually got enormous consequences. So I'd say much more from the bottom up, much more, we're much more playing catch up than we are foreseeing these things. And actually, to be fair to those people who've developed those products, um, a lot of these things are unforeseeable ahead of time. So a lot of them are foreseeable and we're getting better at foreseeing them. But, you know, it may be it may be a question of gender today. But what is the perversity that's going to come in tomorrow? Um, you know, some of that's going to be surprise us no matter how careful we are. Uh, well, you have generated a ton of questions during this talk. So thank you so much. We had somebody say this is one of their favorite events that they've listened to and if we can have you back. So um, oh. I think there's a lot more here. We, we have 15 questions that we weren't able to get to today. Um, so again, thank you so much. I do just want to remind everyone that we did record the event and we will send it out tomorrow night. Um, but I wanted to ask if you have any closing thoughts and then we usually ask if there's anything um if people are interested in this topic which they clearly are if there are more areas they can go read podcasts or of course send the link to your book um, but anything else to kind of follow learning on this topic okay um well i, I guess my website robbrooksoneword.net um is probably a good place to to where i sort of aggregate a lot of the resources although i'm a couple of weeks behind in doing that because uh, we've just had a flurry of publicity um, but I'm, I'm absolutely, you know, thrilled at the level of discussion that we've had today at the, the quality of the questions, the couple that I can see out of the corner of my eye, um, that I haven't been able to get to, too, are, you know, really great questions, really fantastic engagement. So what I would love is for anybody who is interested in what I've had to say, um, who, who wants to ask any questions, feel free to send me an email um, or, or uh, reach out on social media, particularly Twitter. That's the main platform that I use. Um, or, you know, and, and obviously feel free to spread the word about the book and about the ideas um, I know that not everyone's going to agree with it. I kind of hope it's that kind of book anyway, because this is stuff that's important. So, um, but but most of all, I just want to say thank you to all of you for coming and to um, you and, and the organizers and Kambis for, for hosting me because it's been such a, a cool event to do. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And, and knowing you're literally on the other side of the world from us here in DC. So thank you for waking up. Um, somebody said this has been a really fun and informative question, talk and I really can't agree more. So thank you so much. Have a great day. Everyone else have a great evening and um, we'll see you all at our next event. Have a great night. Thank you so much. Bye.